you know, if you went in front after a third of the project is completed, then you get a third. When you complete two thirds of the project, you get two thirds. If you complete the project under the designated time and under budget, you get a bonus. If you go over, then you get penalized. So that's what I do. It's a third of 30 third. That's what they do in construction. This is construction, so it's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, anytime you start talking about development and construction projects, uh, it definitely uh, can become a challenge sometimes. I, I think the key for me is that I would always have my door open for anyone who's having problems, legitimate problems, uh, or at least they believe in legitimate problems, and try to work through them with them. And, uh, and in my position on the council, I uh, try to use my influence if I can see a situation where uh, things are not being handled properly to try to get the back on the right track. Uh, I think it's also the case that, that uh, we may need more staff as well to uh, uh, review projects and, uh, and figure out how to make them happen. Uh, so that's something that I'm looking into as well. And then uh, regarding the issues of I-10 uh, in particular, uh, that is always a challenge, you know, working with the state and uh, uh, other, the county and so on. So, uh, uh, but again, uh, as I'm aware of issues, and I would certainly uh, want to tell them and uh, try to come up with solutions. I have to say that uh, regarding the situation there, I attend uh, nearly all the springs. Uh, I don't know the particulars on that at this point, but I would be happy to look into it. Uh, uh, this is the final one did on day one. Thank you. And the, uh, the first question you asked me about, you know, how painful and slow it is for zoning, I'm going to give you a sad answer uh, at the beginning, but I think there's a solution for that. The second one, uh, there is a solution. I, uh, I get, I, my clients pay me to help them push the zoning through. Okay? So I, I work for churches and schools and homeowners associations and then, you know, other people, uh, you know, who have small businesses who need zoning to change. Um, and because I'm just showing up and because I know who to ask, I'm able to do it much more quickly than if you went on your own. That's sad. It shouldn't be that way. Right? I shouldn't be able to feed my children by making the system go faster for because you can afford me, and it not be fast enough for you because you can't. So what I would do is, um, I, I, I do know that one of the reasons it's so slow is they are, they are understaffed with corporate development services. They're very understaffed. And uh, so they have to pick and choose which projects for them are priorities. Uh, so they, need, they do need to increase that. Uh, as far as the process itself, though, there is this thing that we talked about earlier called code-based zoning. And we put code-based zoning into place on some parcels on the south side, very large parcels. Um, and when we designed that, it worked. And it's just a color by numbers way of knowing exactly what you can put, what you can't put, and what you know, and how long it'll take to make those changes. It can be done. Other cities have figured this out. We figured it out in small portions of the city. As far as traffic goes, Cynthia is absolutely right. That's the way it should be. Uh, you know, the third, third, third. And that's the way it is. We do that right now. What we don't do, and what we should do, is do uh, achievement incentives, where if you finish it way earlier, you get paid even with the contract price. Every time you do that, you'll be surprised. Those projects get finished very, very quickly. Thank you. Uh, Pat, did you want to? Um, yes, I want to mention that when I was designing the project, I was looking at the zoning for my
just here and set up another because they don't make it with height. And then you find yourself that they have not been paid, they stop working because they cannot buy materials, they cannot hire people. So I would pay attention to subcontracting, especially in San Antonio for these large companies that are the prime uh, contractors. They, there might be an issue there. Thank you. Let's take it is it, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the fifth question. Our current city councilman, he thinks that we need to address planning and zoning. We need to do something about planning. Zoning, we can appoint someone from the districts. Question, are y'all prepared to do this for planning? Because it's been talked about in city councils, but it's been poo pooed. So, are all y'all ready to go to the newly elected councilmen and discuss this and make some changes? So there's my question. For the sake of time, let's, let's keep these up on these answers. I, I want to get as much as we can. Uh, if you guys don't mind saying last 9.30, you know, we're, we're going to keep going. So, and if you need to put another question. Yeah, we're going to start with that. Okay. Um, I think I know about that case that he's referring to. And I had the opportunity of uh, listening uh, about no specifics, but um, I am resolved to bring somebody to represent this today in the Sony Commission that understands the issues that we crystal clear. I don't miss with people having, you know, a, 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 a not a very clean idea or a name or etc. that is going to represent us. I don't want any interests uh, of any kind that will get involved in this whole evolution. I want somebody who will be, will be just dedicated to take care of the citizens and not to special interests. And I make this promise today in front of all of you because I'm sick and tired of hearing you know, about all these uh, interests that are happening, special interests that are happening. And people show up and try to push this downgrading of, of pieces of land. So I promise that I will take care. As soon as I violate it, I will take care of this issue because I am not in agreement with what's going on now. Thank you, I want to make sure I understand this question because there's an echo in here. Were you asking if we would appoint someone to the zoning commission? No. About the planning commission. About the planning commission. They tried to change that. The current city council, they didn't want to do that. They liked it the way it is because there are vested interests to keep it the way it is. There's no person that's appointed from each district on the planning commission. So you want to appoint someone from the district? So what can you do? What can you do to work with your fellow councilmen to make a change to this, to the planning commission? Where it's just not people who are related to land development, real estate professionals. I, I think if I can summarize this, it's a new question about more citizen engagement in the planning process as opposed to just land developers. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So I agree. That's one of the big problems that we have in our local government is that city council will listen to the special interests and not the people. And as your city councilwoman, I can tell you, I would make sure that your voice is heard. That is how the government is set up to be. Not to just listen to the special interests. But in order for it to work, we have to work as a community. We have to have the people that are willing to step up to the plate to do the work because one person cannot do it by themselves. If you want to be heard, you have to be willing to work with your council person to take the time off to go, you know, represent and to work towards that. And I agree, we have to have more transparency and the people's voice should be heard more so than you know, a developer that's giving a city council person, you know, a donation so they're going to do what they want and forget about what the people have to say. So, Thank you. I would support that. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I think it's very important for citizens to be engaged in planning, and I certainly would uh, support uh, making changes to the current uh, planning uh, the efforts that the city is engaged in. Um, and the way that the city uh, goes through the planning process uh, to increase uh, citizen engagement. Uh, I think it's uh, absolutely critical. So yes, I would want to 
definitely uh, make changes to get more uh, involved citizens in the planning process. Thank you. Man. Can you repeat the question? No, I'm kidding. Don't worry. <laughs> the, uh, I, I'll tell you the answer for me is to make sure that the people who you appoint to these boards know what they're talking about. Right? I certainly think it's important to have citizen representation from the neighborhoods. Uh, and we've got so many smart people who work in the neighborhoods, who are business folks, who have experience with real estate and zoning and all that. I would search and do a very, very thorough uh, vetting of the kind of quality people that we've got out there. Not just somebody who paid the city council person five hundred dollars during the campaign and you know wants to play for a number. Number one. Number two, the apartment the situation that you're talking about. Uh, I, we got to work on that. I represent some of the homeowners associations in the nearby area. That downtown case was brutal, uh, and our city council person, Ron Nierberg, took a lot of bruises uh, on that case. Uh, and I talked about that case a number of times before he actually took those bruises. And that case is not necessarily a study in zoning, it's a study in leadership. Uh, sometimes you have to stand up knowing that you're going to lose. Ron knew full well that he was going to lose that fight. Zoning Commission. He knew he was going to lose this development on City Council, and he still fought anyway because it was the right thing to do. Because having apartment complexes right on top of another neighborhood wasn't the right call for that one day. Thank you, Tom. Well, I want to first thank you for the question. Also, uh, thank you for picking up that after your pet and uh, picking up after others. Pick up later. I appreciate that. And that goes back to us as members of the community looking out for each other and doing what's right. So talk about what to do with right? That's one of the lessons I learned in high school. When I learned to stand up for myself and stand up for others, is to me, uh, you know, there's only uh, you know two people I have to answer to, and that's that's God and that's myself. And so I'm, I'm always going to stand up for what I feel is right, even if it costs me. And that's something I've done in my workplace, and I'm not willing to, to, to sit back and complain. That's why, before I ran, I volunteered to become Special Conscious Coordinator for District Day. I went out and pursued that opportunity. Nobody gave it to me because I wanted to make a difference and stand up for what was right. The other question I had is about how do you work with the other council? That's where, uh, you know, working in business, a lot of times we have competing priorities, and that's a skill set that I've developed. How do I, how do I work with, uh, you know, not only my, my co workers, but also my superiors to, to get them to buy into my vision? And that's what we're going to have to do as city council. Oh, I'm out of time, but now we have to talk more about that later. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Tim Kadosko. I've been a uh, resident of uh, District 8 for almost 29 years. Uh, and I've seen quite a bit of development going on around, in and around this area, uh, especially the past 10 years. We're talking about how the population is going to be growing quite a bit. One of the things that I've noticed everyone talked about at Grief on was tree preservation and parks, things like that. As developers come in from out of state and just want to build up their apartments and just Leave. They're just going down trees and paying a small fine to get away, get around tree ordinances. What will you do to strengthen the tree ordinances and continue to keep our canopy alive and well, and not create all these asphalt jungles that keep appearing, especially around car lots? I would also propose that new car lots that were cars being sold. Uh, trees be placed at the end of each row, at least in the parking lots, because trust me, it is, this is contributing to global warming. It really is. And I just, I, I'm just concerned how our health country is just getting mowed away and getting plowed away. But I really feel that tree ordinances need to be much stronger. So, what would you think? Let's start with one minute. Okay. I'm a tree lover too, so I hear your pain. I mean, my husband and I built our home. There were a lot of trees on it, and I asked them to keep it to a minimum of how many trees, because this first one, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, home builder was notorious for doing exactly what you just said, just to plow it down. So I would say that we need to pass an ordinance to preserve the trees that are there, to work around the trees that are there, so that they're there, and also to plant more trees so that we can have that canopy. You know, trees are really good. They provide the shade, they also absorb the runoff, you know, when there's too much rain. And so it, it also provides a, a, something beautiful to look at too, besides just asphalt. My question is, would you pass the ordinance? Yes. Are true preservation? Yes, I think I said that at the beginning. Okay. Yes. Uh, You're talking the same language. <laughs> well, 
that everybody loves trees, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, well, I, I think what happens is that developers, they see money and they, uh, they see that they can make more money just by leveling trees, and, uh, and I think, yes, we do need to have a stronger ordinance to uh, cut, prevent them from doing that, but it needs to be part of any development consideration is how the trees are going to be preserved and, uh, and the developers kept in check in that regard. And, yeah, so we do have a tree ordinance, right? Um, and it's a very, very well worded tree ordinance that is anemic and very skinny and um, can easily be violated. And the consequences for violating it aren't that impressive. And so there are lots of developers that will violate it and consider it a cost of construction. Um, like all ordinances, the only way people follow them is if you actually enforce them. And so we do need code enforcement with teeth, right? We need subpoena power uh, at development services, and we need people to be able to go on property. As part of the license that you get, the permit that you get in order to construct, you have to be able to, you know, as a city, go on the property before they start knocking down trees, count the trees, and say, these trees better be up, right, when we come back, right? Um, other cities do this, and we can too. There's no reason we should. Tony. Okay. So thank you again for your question and uh, the amazing suggestion you had there too about, about uh, the cars and parking lot. So I want to touch on both of those real quick. Is one is here in San Antonio, it seems like we have a real problem with following rules. And when people break the rules, there are no consequences or very little. So we do need to add teeth to that to make sure that the rules are followed because that's why they're there. The other thing I want to do is make sure that we have more and more engagement. So if you have ideas like that, why can't we have a forum online or in person where we can share those ideas? Uh, I happen to work for a great organization where we have uh, an innovation page that's open to anybody in the company. Where no matter what line you're in, if you have a great idea, you can share it, and then everybody in the company can see it and comment on it, and we can refine it, and a lot of those get implemented into to, to the technology that drives our company forward. Why can't we do that here in the city so that way your voice can be heard and we can talk about how to solve this together? Thank you. Pat. I am very lucky that in my neighborhood you cannot touch the trees to get to ask permission, so I would have to get it, no problem. But I own a building on Horseback Road, and two weeks ago um, I gave permission to the Chinese restaurant from my left to build half of a parking lot but do not touch their trees or mine. So I came back after the weekend and that big tree was gone. So I felt wrong and I got pale and I made a big deal about it and they brought the arborist and they apologized but my tree was gone. So yes, I'm gonna fight that you let dog be in for those trees because now they are getting very close to my other trees. I have six huge trees on the right side that we, my, my area has uh, trees everywhere. Green shade, green beauty, and, and it's uh, amazing. I have a patio front that people can see with all my trees and plants. And they are about to touch, I mean, to cut my trees. I ran out of my office and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And they have plants that were provided to them saying, don't to touch those trees. And, I, I sounded like I was hysterical, but I was. Because if I could not have gone out, we would have got four beautiful trees. So We're yes, okay. I'm going to do that. Well, that's the one you want. Thank you, friends. But my name is Bill Alter. Uh, so I think something that San Antonio is lacking is an alternative uh, to anyone on the city besides the bar. Uh, obviously, light rail system and building light rail systems are expensive, but uh, we do have a ton of commercial rail lines that run across the city. For example, there's one that goes from the Rin walking down to South. Uh, so I'm wondering, as a council, I think we should be willing to help facilitate conversations with companies like Union Pacific uh, in investing in technology that could allow those commercial rail lines to be simultaneously used with passenger. Uh, Cynthia, what's up? Did you say commercial rail lines? Is that what you said? Yes. You start commercial rail lines? No. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm more of a Okay, so there's commercial rail lines all over the city that are owned by companies like Union like Pacific, it's not leased. So there would have to be some sort of pressure put onto those companies to allow a conversation to get and technology to be invested in so that they can be utilized for passenger rail as well and not make us have to build completely new rail systems all across the city. So you want us to use existing roads? Right, which would save money and make it easier, but there would need to be technology invested so that they could be used safely. 
But I appreciate your question. However, I'm not a proponent of rail at all because of the cost. It's a hundred million dollars a mile. And with technology, the way that it's going, I see other things on the horizon. So, you're standing back up. Yeah, because like I said, that what I said, it it's limited to the existing rail. Right, so you're not going to be spending a hundred million dollars a mile because it exists. So you need to invest in technology that would allow simultaneous use of passenger and which could be done. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Again, it's rail, and those rail lines don't go everywhere. And so you're going to have to create more rail. And in talking to Mark Buchanan, who's VP of VIA, he told me that their plan in the 20 uh, SA tomorrow plan is to connect all the regional centers. And so there will be casualties, is what he said, which means that if he has to plow through someone's home, they're going to do that. And so I'm not a proponent of that. And I would rather sit back and wait and see what's on the horizon through technology because I see things that are coming up, like SkyTrain. And those are portable pods that they're utilizing in the air. If you look up uh, Mountain View, California, they implemented those. And those are one tenth the cost of rail. So I'm sorry, I'm not a proponent of that. Thank you, Paul. Well, I, I am a component of uh, light rail. I think that we will have to engage that um, in the foreseeable future. Um, obviously, it's one of those things where it's, it's a planning issue and we have to come up with solutions. I think certainly using current rail lines is one solution uh, that could be beneficial to reducing the cost uh, for adding uh, rail commuting system, such as a rail commuting system within the city. Uh, I could even envision at some point asking uh, the National Rail Lines uh, to build lines uh, outside of the city <coughs> and we could completely convert uh, their rail lines into uh, flights and fees within the city. I, I know that that would be quite controversial, but uh, it's an idea and uh, that's one of the things I, I like to try to do is, is try to think outside the box and try to think of other ways to do things and I think certainly converting existing rail lines and using them uh, for computer uh, trains would be a uh, good uh, use of uh, uh, those lines. And uh, so yes, I would, I would uh, advocate uh, considering doing that. Thank you. And so your, your question is very specific in that you're not even talking about light rail. You're talking about existing rail lines that already crisscross San Antonio and using those rail lines to help San Antonians get from point A to point B. You bet. That's a fantastic idea. And um, actually, that's something that I got to work on in 2004 on the south side. We created uh, a team and I that was called the Alamo Rail District. We did that in reaction to Union Pacific's reluctance to work with us at all on getting uh, certain parts for certain manufacturers in and out of San Antonio. And they were charging us so much money because they knew they were the only one. So what we did is we went and changed the law. And we said that we're going to buy law, borrow your rent, we'll pay you what the law says is going to uh, you know, cost us. And UP, the Union Pacific, immediately came and started negotiating with us. And we now have a really cool rail district on the south side that is accomplishing some of what, you, what you're talking about. It's totally doable. It's a great plan. I love it. Thank you for asking the question. You know what I did? Don't want to steal it right here? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this goes right back to what I was talking to you a little before. I mean, we have 1.4, 1.5 million people in here. There's going to be people like yourself that have amazing ideas. Why wasn't that something that we could put up on the website? Say, hey, look, why don't we use this in mind? And then we can have that conversation with the council. The council can come back to you and say, post on there, say, hey, look, we're looking into this. Here's some of the challenges with the roadblocks. We can talk about uh, with, with the, the city's legal team. What are the legal barriers? We can talk to TCI. What are the costs uh, that we have to we would have to do to modify those rails to, to handle transportation? But the point is, we're not having these conversations where it's easy for us as citizens to, to, to suggest them. But secondly, for us to follow up to see what the city's doing, that transparency is not there. So you may suggest that, you come to them, they say, yes, I love it, but then we, it, it dies when they never hear about it. Let's create transparency for the use of technology so we can all be on board with what's going on. Thank you, Pat. I agree. Uh, I, I'm not for using those uh, old uh, railroad tracks. Um, I, I just, I don't even, you know, I, I have uh, the train that goes by over Spark Road, and it, it is transmission, uh, but I just don't understand how we can use the same railroad 
throw the traps to transport people over to those certain areas that we will be able to because I think that they are used now for cargo, maybe. So I would like to hear more about that. And I agree with Tony. There must be more transparency about all these projects and all these different issues that we have with transportation. Again, I am going to um, you know, try to uh, learn more about this because the thing that I am aware of is that I would like uh, to use a little bit of all the things. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, first of all, my name is Muhammad Salim Rana. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the community members here from Stanley Center. Uh, you guys have talked about uh, all the streets, construction, trees, cats, dogs, everybody else. My specific concern is every time something happens in the United States, there's one of the different from city of San Antonio with the mayor, or chief of the police, or somebody will come and give us a big lap about don't you wait for nothing will happen to you. So this just a fake promise and they come and they say, don't worry about it. Why we are waiting something happen in any minorities, church, or our Islamic center, or there's a temple, Sikh or Muslims, or all the minority and especially specifically minorities. Why can't we provide them the, this is the number one priority, should be the city to providing the security. For example, today, do we have anybody, policemen here today, you see it? Somebody walking, shoot everybody, all big news in CNN. And the city will come up and have a big beating, so you'll die, don't worry, or you'll protect you. Protect you what? So we need to city, we need to, I expect at least, I know you guys are running for, and the city, one of the councilmen, the councilmen. But I expect at least from your area, would you promise us to provide us a security from the city? Because we cannot afford to have four or five policemen, three policemen on a regular basis. If they cannot provide every single day, at least on a special day. We have some certain holidays, Friday prayers, month of Ramadan, there will be thousand people standing here. And every day is open. For God's sake, why are we are waiting something happening so you for God to be I don't want to say these words. So when we want to wake up and have somebody, I expect you guys to give me this answer. Thank you, sir. 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 Yeah, so, so, I mean, there, there are, you know, attacks and ethnic minority groups all over the country. Mosques are being burned down, uh, you know, people like the Tianzhen, just a judge, uh, just two days ago, you know, the first Muslim female judge, uh, who was fighting the Hudson River. Uh, so the question is, what kind of security do you provide us, or if at all? Well, I agree. That's one of the things that you have to do when you have a problem, especially if, Let's just use Muslims, for example, if they're being attacked, and if you're being attacked, then absolutely, you have to deploy your law enforcement to patrol those areas. And that's how you reduce crime. And in fact, I did a research uh, project on this, and it was, if you're having a crime issue, you deploy your police officers where they, the problem is at. You don't just, oh, we got to call, no. Well, if you're, if you're a target, then you provide the, the support, and you control the neighborhoods, and you make sure everything is okay, and that's how you control it. And once they see that they're protected, then they go away. You don't allow them to set up the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Well, the, the challenge is, of course, our, our police department is, is stretched in as it is. Uh, I will mention that my experience is that usually when there's a facility uh, or there's an event or at a facility where there's some concern about security, uh, police officers are available or willing to work uh, on their off hours. Uh, and I will say he's going to be compensated for that by the organization that's hosting the event. So I, I would say it's mainly up to uh, any organization where they feel that they need security uh, to look into hiring security for that. All of that said, certainly uh, I would be open to visiting with people about their particular issues and their particular security concerns. And if it was a situation where it seemed like uh, it would be appropriate uh, for the city police uh, to, to be involved uh, in helping 
the security at an event, and certainly we would look into that. But uh, usually the first step is for the, the uh, community or the organization to uh, make their own plans in terms of what their security needs are. Uh, but I would certainly be willing to talk about that if, uh, if that's not adequate. Thank you. Uh, Man, before we get your answer, I just want to let the doctor know. Each of prayers being delayed till 10 o'clock. We started late, so, so we're going to end at 10 o'clock. Uh, thank, you asked, thank you so much for the question. You asked for a promise, and so here's the promise. Yes, you're going to get more police here often because I'll ask for it. And Katsuki has to ask police to show up somewhere. You know why they show up? Because we city councilmen are in charge of their salaries and they really want to make city council people happy. It happens all the time. City council people ask police to spend more time in one neighborhood versus another because they're getting complaints. All you gotta do is pick up the phone and call me, and you'll get police officers as often as you want. That's a pretty simple answer to a pretty simple question. Thank you. just because they look a little different, release something differently, or, or live their life a little differently. Uh, you know, to, to have those, those vulnerable members being picked up or used, it's, it's not right. So, as possible, you're right, we, we can leave by example and ask, let's, let's make sure we're, we're, we're protecting these people, and it's more than just a sound like. And to start that, what we have to do is, is start working with, with our city manager and our, our police force, because we're short of about 225 officers, maybe even a little more. So we need to get to the bottom of, of how do we recruit enough officers, but also the right type, so they can provide the services to truly protect and serve us. And yes, I will, just like Annie said, if you give me a call, and I'm here to help you, and lead, lead by example. Thank you, Pat. From experience, I, I believe that this is a two-way street. We need more policemen, and we need to be aware of what's happening in our surroundings. We need to work at, we have a team, we need to be vigilant of what's going on around the, the neighborhood, the church. My, my building, uh, another building where he constantly on horseback, we call the police, we met with them, and we told them that we were sick and tired of graffiti, of theft, broken glasses, and then we formulated a plan. And then we added, we added more policemen, and then we had more, more policemen, and then we were always looking and making sure that we were not in danger. So I think it's a two ways to we need to work together with the police. Uh, and also request from the city manager more policemen. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask like the next five people to ask their question continuously and uh, assuming they stay on the theme, I'm going to ask you guys to answer them. It's a challenge for you guys. Okay? You're, you're running the city council, you're going to get lots of challenges on this, okay? Let's, let's keep getting the questions. You get the same time to answer as many of you. Mia? I will speak to the question. Yes, when you ask a question, you come closer to the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, good, good uh, evening. Uh, my name is Hassan Kamshadani, I'm on the first of GTSA. Uh, my question goes a bit beyond the boundaries of District A. So, if like that, as a council member, council woman, you actually play a very important role in shaping the future of the whole city, not just that District A. So, what I want to ask you is, what is the biggest challenge in your view that faces the city over the next few years, and what are your plans for dealing with it? Okay, thank you. Now, hold on. What are your plans for the future beyond District A? Okay, go ahead. As you know, San Antonio hosts over 8,000 refugees from other countries. These are women and children who have fled countries where they were victims of genocide, chemical weapons, torture, beheadings, and uh, other horrible fates. Today, many nonprofit organizations and local churches are helping these families in need with basic services, English classes, uh, financial literacy, health screenings, and legal services. Cynthia, this question is actually simply for you. I was looking at your Facebook page and found the following comments you made about refugees coming to Texas. Uh, and I'm going to quote. Quote, we don't want them, we don't need them, send them back. They can't speak the language, they can't assimilate because they're foreigners. Uh, things such as even going so far as to call them terrorists and uh, also 
in so far as the talking about exercising the Second Amendment. Oh, uh, Second Amendment rights. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, do you stand by this comment and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Thank okay, you. let's let's get it. Let's get it under one more. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. D. I'd like uh, to thank you all for being here for us. Uh, my quick question is about Islamophobia and the bullying of our children and women with cars and so on. I am receiving daily accounts of a lot of hate crimes against our community all over uh, the United States of America, unfortunately. Uh, my quick question is how can we take measures in the city, a beautiful city of San Antonio, to make it really a model for peace and coexistence and respect? Good evening. My name is Natsuki Sadiqi and I'm a member of the Muslim community and uh, along with the other members of the community, I appreciate being here. My quick question is, uh, actually started with a comment, as we all know that the uh, bulk of our economy draws from small businesses. It, it's energized with the performance of small businesses. I'm aware of the programs that the city has for small businesses and their growth, um, including the UDSA Small Business Administration Program and the other certifications. But what additional ideas do you have that would benefit small businesses in the city? Thank you. Yes, you can tell Good evening, my name is John Ryan. I'm an immigration attorney. I'm the executive director of the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. We're a refugee resettlement agency. We're also a legal services agency for refugees and immigrants here in San Antonio. I'm an immigrant and I'm also a, a homeowner here in District 8. Um, I was asked tonight to come and speak and ask a question on behalf of the refugee community. My initial reaction was that I didn't want to do that. I represent refugees and immigrants, I organize with them, but I don't pretend to speak for the community. I was told that they would like me to speak because members of the community were asked, but they were afraid. And that right there is the subject of my question. The people that we work with, and you're going to be leading a district that is known for its connection with the refugee community, a diverse part of our city. Many of them have fled countries that we know through their charismatic, unpredictable, loud mouth, bombastic leaders. Nothing like in our country. <laughs> but as I prepare asylum applications, as I work with refugees, they're not fleeing those despots. The people, the names in those applications of the ones who are hurting, harming, oppressing people are local officials in those countries. And people who come to this country may associate you with those people that they fled. And we're entering into a country now, those people who do those actions in, in countries we associate with refugees, they're doing so because they're operating under that permission structure that was set by that bombastic, unpredictable, erratic leader. We are now in a country where this permission structure is also opening up. We are seeing attacks on communities like it has never happened before. And it's not just theoretical. We have a bill in the Senate of Texas, SB4, which is prepared to turn our cities into instruments of this oppression. Profiling, arresting, willy-nilly members of communities based on how they look. What are you going to do as someone whose job is to protect our communities and who has the power to do so? You cannot say that this is a Washington issue. This is a San Antonio issue. What are you going to do to protect me, my friends, and our communities? Uh, so I'm not going to ask you so many questions or anything. I'm going to actually follow up on this gentleman here. Uh, but my question is, you know, you've seen a lot of issues in America that come to do with Muslims, the hijab, Muslim women, where we belong in America. Um, not just by our national leaders, but also by our local officials and local neighbors. So my question is, what do you guys actually believe about Muslims? What do you believe our location in San Antonio, well, um, sorry, our position in San Antonio is supposed to be? Are we Americans? Are we a bit different? Do we not belong? And the reason I ask this is because in Britain, there has been a question of whether Muslim women should be allowed to wear the hijab. 
And there's a lot of people that are pushing that they don't belong here, they shouldn't be wearing the job, they shouldn't be exercising their women's rights in the world. So I just wanted you guys to address that. Thank okay, you. So, 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 that's, that's, that's going to be the last question because we're almost completely out of time. Uh, Paul, let's start with you. Answer the refugee question and the question about Islam. The last question about Islam. It's, it's, it's Paul's turn. Go ahead. Well, uh, yes, these are the very important issues, and obviously they've become you know, more important here recently. Uh, things have been going on not only in the rest of the world, but in the United States as well. And I think uh, certainly we need to stand up to uh, keep America diverse and uh, to support uh, those who immigrate here. Uh, who, who, uh, that this is a, a nation of immigrants, I mean, basically, except for the Indians, we're, we're all uh, immigrants to this country. Uh, of course, they were immigrants about 10,000, 10, 20,000 years ago themselves, I suppose. Uh, I think that's actually what's made our country great, is the fact that we are a nation of immigrants. So I would definitely work uh, as hard as I can to support uh, uh, Muslims and uh, other uh, minorities uh, in, in dealing with whatever issues uh, they may uh, face. Thank you. And these are two minutes, but if, if you want to continue, you can. <coughs> so, uh, first of all, thank, thank you for what you do for that organization. I'm actually thinking of voting for you for this debate. Uh, 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 you belong. You are San Antonio. District 8 is the most diverse district in this city. 8,000 refugees live in San Antonio. Almost every single one of them lives right around here. 30,000 families that call themselves Muslims live in San Antonio. Almost all of them live in District 8. What would I do if I found out that somebody was being discriminated against by an employer or by the by law or by anybody else or feeling unsafe in their home or attacked? I would step down from that dais and I would stand with you and I would sue whoever it was for you, for free. And that's what the city needs to do more often, is to fight fights. Even if we know it's going to be a hard fight. So when the um, Texas legislature decided to change the redistricting to make sure that fewer Latinos voted and more Republicans got up there, Robert, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I stood up and I went and filed you know, necessary papers in court to make sure that we helped set that aside. And I'm happy to tell you that the Supreme Court has recently come down and said, uh-uh, that is the most racist thing we've ever seen, and that is not Texan. You are Texans. You know who delivers babies in this town? Muslim doctors. The first person, oftentimes, that a Texan meets is a Muslim. It is unacceptable for that person then to be afraid of the adult that person is, that little baby is going to become. Not my San Antonio. So, uh, to, to hear about, you know, the, the, uh, the fear that the refugee community has, it, it, it obviously breaks my heart. And to hear with the other gentleman quoted that we have a candidate who says something about, uh, you know, immigrants come here and not learning the language that they don't love, that makes me upset. My dad came here at the age of 15, not knowing any English. He graduated from high school, started a family, went to work, realized that the importance of education. He started interviewing with the, the uh, admissions officers, and one of them told him, you know what, we're not here to teach you English. And, and that pissed him off. And he said, you know what, now I'm not going to go to the university, but I'm going to graduate from the University of Michigan. And that's exactly what he did. He lived his American dream, so that happened with mine, and I am here to stand up with everybody so they can live their American dream, because you're all Americans here. My U.S. citizenship, and I've been discriminated just like you, and I didn't know how to feel. But through business, through friendships, I have been able to open doors, and I think that's what I'm going to do because we immigrants, we bring a lot to this country. We're mostly small business owners, and then we bring business, we bring uh, jobs, we bring opportunities. I, in my country, I have seven different nationalities of small businesses. 
we talk about the issues that we're discussing here, and we believe and we think that by doing business, developing, you know, the opportunities for others like us, we are able to become stronger, unified, and we will conquer. I promise you. Okay. So, I know what it's like to be discriminated against. I, mean, I wasn't raised here in San Antonio. I was raised in Amarillo, Texas. My mother was born here, but she moved away. And up there, I'm brown. Olive. But I wasn't white. So I know what it's like to be discriminated against. Okay? So I feel your pain too. And it's not right. But you know what's really bad? It doesn't matter which country you're from. Prejudice is there from around the world. And I don't understand it and I don't know why. But it's just there. In my uh, Hispanic family, there's prejudices. On my white side, there's prejudices. And I know other people from other countries that are prejudiced too. And it's just there. It's not right. We, we all have to work together. If you are an American citizen, then you have every right to be here. If you're here on visa, you have every right to be here. And you shouldn't be discriminated against. It's against the law. So, uh, I'm sorry, you can put no, go ahead. Okay. I was going to get so we're almost out of time. Let's do one minute uh, closing statements. Thank you for I'm really sorry. I, Cindy, the gentleman asked you about six or seven statements that you made on your Facebook page calling refugees terrorists. Terrorists. <laughs> Those people who escaped the worst of the worst and are seeking only neighbors and friends and kindness. And you're running for city council, and then you're having all to sit here and tell these people that it's wrong to not like people like that. What are you talking about? <laughs> Jesus tells us, whatever we do to the least of us, we do to him. So when we see people fleeing oppression that are hurting, that are hungry, that are poor, it is our job to help those people. I would like for Cynthia to explain in a moment because I am a little bit shocked too, but she has a right to explain. I want to close by telling the lady who wants opportunities for a small business because I want to help her. I, I know how to do it and I want to make sure that I talk to her. I want to close by saying that I'm very honored to be here. Your questions are amazing. I, I really believe that you have the right to be in this country like I have the right to be in this country for the right of people. I want to tell you that I pledge that I will work with you just like if you were my brothers and my sisters because I feel the pain. And thank you very much. Okay, so I want you to see what's happening here. Okay, someone stood up in a political room and made accusations saying I said something. Really? I haven't seen it. I want to see it. Tomorrow morning you'll be seeing those comments on our okay. Facebook page, okay? Maybe. Maybe. You'll, I'll be showing you exactly those comments. Stand, stand up for yourself. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for Yeah. 
I spent 30 some years fighting illness my country. Now I'm still saying, it's terrible being in the family. It's because we're trying to get